Well, good morning and welcome. This is the official opening of our opening session for the Health Innovation Pavilion. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is a great venue. It's exciting to do this inside this extraordinary event at Scientific Sessions 2023. Um, my name is Patrick Waite. I run the HA Center for Health Tech and Innovation. We are really the tip of the spear for all things digital health, health tech, and AI, which is an exciting area right now, as, uh, as you can imagine. And we're thrilled and thrilled to have you here and to be having so many great presentations and speakers, about 80 total, uh, over the next three days. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, we have a number of our innovator network companies uh, uh, out in this uh, larger pavilion as well, and feel free to visit them. Uh, fundamentally, we uh, are just going to have a lot of fun uh, over these few days. We're going to talk at the intersection of science and technology. And I'd like to thank, in particular, a few key staff uh, from our side, from the AHA, to make this happen. Uh, Dr. Pat Dunn, who many of you know, uh, has really been the architect uh, and developer of this uh, uh, portion of the conference, along with our uh, esteemed volunteers, our health tech advisory group. He's aided by uh, uh, Jeff Makalka, uh, David Santasano, Rachel Charbonneau, and a handful of other really great folks. And we couldn't have done this without them. And obviously, uh, we couldn't have done it without our health tech advisors as well, our volunteers uh, that helped the CHTI uh, run this programming at the AHA. Uh, additionally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Harrington. Um, Bob Harrington, as many of you know, has uh, many titles, uh, many titles uh, outside and inside the AHA. Uh, he also is the chair of our health tech advisory group and has been a longtime friend and advisor uh, to our efforts in uh, digital health and health tech. He's going to help us more formally open the session, talk about our work uh, in this space, and, uh, and then introduce the rest of the opening session. So thank you for being here. And we look forward to chatting with you and, and sharing good thoughts over these few days. Thank you. Thank, th thanks, Patrick. And uh, welcome. Welcome to the opening of the, uh, the health tech part of, uh, of sessions. We've been doing this now for several years, but this is the first time we've ever had an opening event. And I think what we'll try to do is I will give you an overview of what we're doing in health technology within the AHA from the volunteers' perspective. And then I'll turn it over to individuals who are going to walk us through some of the things you're going to see over the next few days. Today we have our opening session. I hope after the opening session that many of you stick around for the beginning of the health tech competition. This has been the uh, proverbial shark tank. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of judges from industry, from HA volunteers, from different intersections of the uh, health tech ecosystem. And it's always been a fun event. This year what we're doing is we've divided it up into two pieces. One is the business pitch, and the second is the science pitch. And it's those two pitches that come together that really allow us to pick the winner. So please stay around for that. We're going to have today uh, uh, new generation imaging and AI, and you'll also begin to meet some of our researchers. Please do walk around and meet some of the innovators that are, uh, that are working with AHA. On Sunday, we have AI and scientific publications. What do the journal editors think? Uh, health tech competition of the science pitch and best practices in digital coaching. Monday, uh, the wrap up here at Scientific Sessions, we're gonna talk about scaling and sustaining a business model for remote patient modeling, uh, monitoring. We have our health tech competition awards around midday, what's new in the innovators network and digital tools and cardiac rehab. So come by, we, we make these uh, a very informal events where you can ask questions, come to the mic, ask the innovators, ask the, uh, the health tech volunteers who are trying to lead some of the discussions. Now, if you're here, I suspect you know this. Uh, digital health market is big and growing. A lot of us use technology in order to access health and, uh, and increasingly we're doing it on mobile devices. So please, use your device, Take pictures at the session today. I see Dr. Bott in the front row. Tweet those out and tell people to come to Heart Hub and uh, the Innovators Network. The current state of the digital health market, uh, a lot of money being spent in this area. And one of the reasons a lot of the companies are here are to network and to meet people. They want to meet you, the scientists, volunteers, who can help them think about, is this the right approach? 
What we often see is that the engineers don't necessarily talk to the clinicians, and the clinicians don't necessarily talk to the engineers. We're trying to create a forum where that can be facilitated. So what is our innovative network? Right now, we have 40 active members. Many of them are here. For those of you who are interested in becoming a part of the Innovators Network, talk to Patrick Waite, talk to Pat Dunn. We really are looking for, uh, for try to help new products launch to the market. This is that final step of translation. How do you take an idea that may benefit patients, that may benefit populations, and pull it over to the market? So that's what we're trying to help with here at the HA. 98 Innovator Network members since we began. Here's our Health Tech Advisory Group. Can I ask the Health Tech Advisory Group who are in the audience, could you just raise your hand? So we got people all over the group here. Feel free to stop people, ask them questions, uh, see how best you might be able to help us at the HA develop a robust health tech <clears throat> ecosystem. These are the kind of things you're going to hear about over the next few days. I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Dr. Bassett, who's going to walk us through some of the specifics of a lot of the programming. These are the areas that we think matches well with the skill set of the science volunteers within AHA. For those of you who aren't AHA members, join the AHA. This is the kind of thing that the AHA is doing now, and uh, we'd love to have your expertise. Our areas of focus, you'll hear more about this in the next section. Fun stuff. Over the course of the next few days, you, you, you can see that even button-down cardiologists start to take off their ties, put on sneakers as they walk around because they're hanging out with the tech community. So a lot of fun, ability to ask questions. One of our uh, longtime volunteers, Craig Beam, on the side of that one, leading a, uh, leading a discussion with a group of our science volunteers and innovators. Here I am with, uh, with our, one of our past presidents, Donald Lloyd-Jones, leading a session last year on cardiac rehab. So this is all the kind of stuff that you'll see over the next few days. It's informal. It's built to be able to ask questions, to network, to really find out how can we develop new products that are going to help our patients, that are going to help our populations, that are going to help our communities. And we can only do that together. Here's one of the, uh, the rooms from last year. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Bassett, who's going to walk us through some of the programming over the next few days. Dr. Bassett? Hello, everybody. Good morning. This is the perfect group I've been waiting all time. Who's excited about health tech, AI, and ML? Okay. And who, who has a sense of dread when it comes to this topic? Okay. There's one person. I think there should be more. AI as ML is really a tool. And when we look at tools, it's not the tool that's the problem, it's the application of the tool, how that tool is used to solve problems. And we really design these educational sessions to help you leverage this tool. If we're not the ones creating the problems that these tools are gonna solve, other people will, and that may not be the ideal solution that we want for ourselves or for our patients. So I encourage you to get involved. The more educated the customer that we have, the better off we will be in terms of how these tools are applied and how they will help us in the future. I want to just highlight a few sessions that we have that are, I think, of particular interest to a lot of people. We have organized these so they're not just isolated health tech sessions, but are, in, but are integrated into all the elements, quality, research, operations, and career advice as well. Once a session is, um, health technology and cardiovascular care in terms of research and clinical setting, which is today at 1130. And for those of you who are really interested in research, that's a great session for that. The other one I think which is really exciting is this uh, 315 sessions for careers in health technology. Every year when I come to conferences or when I'm back at my home institution, people ask me, how do I get more involved? And I feel like this is a complete black box. People don't know how to get off this like traditional clinical pathway or this uh, you know, operational or research career and say, how do I combine those two tools? And we have built a panel of people who are CMIOs, who are CIOs, who are chief quality officers, who have transitioned for academic medicine into industry, and then who have grown their role in industry. And we even have a resident who's really passionate about informatics and informatics education. So throughout that continuity, this is the opportunity to figure out what roles are available and who you can reach out to as you're developing these products in that continuity of journey. 
The health tech competition is amazing for people who want to learn more ideas about what is cutting edge and what we're doing. And I can't emphasize enough the poster sessions. The poster sessions are what will be the main speeches next year and the year after and the keynotes in three to five years. Everybody wants to think they're cutting edge. Poster sessions are the cutting edge stuff. They are the really early research that's gonna be really transformative. Uh, tomorrow, there's a AI impact and quality of care. And then the really the most important thing is how we request how this technology is really applied into the future. And I would encourage you to do that. There are a lot of sessions, and if you can find sessions on the hottest topic, which is like large language models right now, like ChatGPT, you have it open up your schedule. They are inundating everything. So luckily that hype curve is shifting and we'll get less of that and then we'll get mature products in a year or two. And that is what I'm really excited about. I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Marvell to talk about, or wait, did I get it wrong? Oh, sorry Dr. Marvell, thank you so much. I think uh, we're just getting the slides loaded, but I'm gonna talk about novel and uh, medical and lifestyle therapies for cardiovascular disease prevention. My colleague, Dr. Marvel, is gonna build on that with some additional uh, content. Are we getting the slides uh, loaded, Pat? Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, kudos, as was said, to Pat and Patrick and the whole CHTI team for putting together another fantastic health innovation uh, pavilion. My pleasure to help be part of this opening session. These are my disclosures. So I wanted to start with this new uh, cardiovascular kidney metabolic syndrome framework. My colleague, Dr. Chadi Ndumale and team put together this really um, novel framework. And it starts with a focus on lifestyle with primordial prevention and then progresses across these different stages of excess adipose tissue, metabolic uh, risk factors in CKD, subclinical CVD, with you, which you're gonna hear about uh, in this session about really advanced tools using AI and imaging to look at subclinical ASCVD as a portal into uh, preventive treatments. And then stage four being established CVD, uh, where we just saw the exciting uh, select trial results, which I'll get to in a moment. So. Um, these are the components of the CKM syndrome call to action with a patient-centered implementation focus. We really need to move from just passive data collection and describing problems to having the implementation focus after statements such as this come out from AHA around CKM syndrome. So of course, many of us were just over at the opening session for the exciting select trial results, um, begging the question if this is gonna be a new statin in cardiovascular disease prevention, we saw a MACE reduction and all-cause cardio, uh, all-cause mortality reduction in patients with overweight obesity and cardiovascular disease with no history of diabetes, and then the potential to move upstream um, as future trials are, are conducted. Um, so exciting area in, cardiometabolic, in cardiometabolic medicine. Um, in the blood pressure realm, this is particularly relevant to health tech because of the increasing evidence around home-based blood pressure monitoring and the accuracy of that, that it even can exceed in-office uh, visit, uh, visits the, uh, the value of the data in terms of risk prediction and then uh, clinical treatment. So this is a great recent AHA statement that came out on implementation strategies around blood pressure. I wanted to give a specific example of a funded project from AHA uh, in the Restore Network. Um, one of our colleagues, Vaughn Commodore Mensa is leading the linked BP trial, which is pairing a patient facing smartphone app with a clinician dashboard together with community health workers in individuals who have pre-hypertension with the goal of preventing progression to hypertension. So look out for the results of this trial as, as it progresses. Um, in the cholesterol lipid world, there's of course been tremendous innovation over the decades. Uh, now we've gone well beyond statin therapies to azetamide, icosapenethyl, bempedoic acid, the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, now siRNA therapy against PCSK9, and now even with multiple companies working on gene editing against PCSK9 and other lipid targets. So an exciting evolution in, in lipid therapies. And this is an example from one of my patients from Lipid Clinic with homozygous FH. She's now 68 years old with homozygous FH and has basically lived through this tremendous innovation over the years in lipid therapy, starting on each of the new interventions as they become available. She now has an LDL of 57. She started with LDL of 1,000, now has an LDL of 57 
uh, on a combination of high-intensity statin therapy, azetamide, PCSK9 monoclonal antibody, evanicumab, which is another novel therapy for an against ANGPTL3, and she also did previously had an ileal bypass procedure. So pretty amazing. However, many of our patients we know are not getting that well treated, and one of the hats I wear within the AHA is as the chair of the statistics uh, committee. And so this is a concerning curve from our latest statistics document. The next one will be out in January. But after reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality from 2000 to 2010, in both women and men, we've seen an increase in cardiovascular disease mortality over the last decade. Of course, there's population aging effects, but this also reflects the fact that we are simply not getting the job done well enough in terms of cardiovascular risk factor control. That blue line you see there is a holistic measure of risk factor control in the secondary prevention population, and it's been a flat line. So despite all the innovation in the biopharmaceutical world where we really have such a tremendous armamentarium now, we have not implemented as well as we need to do, and, and so this is really begs for a, sh a shift in our focus of innovation to how do we deliver these uh, therapies to our patients more reliably? You saw this, uh, Bob shared this really nice figure that the CHTI team has put together on the patient healthcare journey. As we think about shifting those concerning trends in cardiovascular disease, we really need to attack this at, at all levels of the patient journey, from the early primordial prevention phase to pre-acute, acute, post-acute, post and home care. Um, this is, we're really grateful to the AHA for funding the strategically focused research, research network on health tech and innovation. We've had the pleasure of working with the Stanford, Michigan, C Cincinnati, and BU teams. It's really been a great collaborative uh, network. Here are some pictures of the collaborative creativity happening within this network uh, from our team as well as from our visit to Stanford. Uh, and and um, it's really just been a great uh, uh, experience. So um, part of what we're doing in building technology in that network is building from the ground up through a human-centered design approach. And um, we need to view the work through a health equity lens. So my colleague, Dr. Lisa Cooper, said that the use of innovative tech makes it possible to involve underserved communities at all stages of the design, implementation, evaluation. So as we shift to thinking about how we build solutions to more reliably deliver the care that we know works, uh, we really need to think in this bottom-up approach. This is an example of a human-centered design session happening in Baltimore with diverse patients. You see that quote in the background about the power of education, but we start with the patients as the end user or clinicians as the end user, deeply understand the problem, co-ideate, co-create solutions, and work backwards to the technology. Um, one of the powerful messages we continue to hear from our patients is they're craving better engaging educational materials. They're going to Google, YouTube, finding things on their own. They want us to be creating this high quality engaging educational material. So for more on this, check out one of our star fellow, Nino Isakadze's poster on Monday about using chat GPT content analysis um, our clinical review team, as well as the feedback from Human Center Design to create these animated videos using a software platform. We've actually been leveraging a, a platform that Larry Allen and his team had used in the EPIC HF trial. Um, so um, we've also used this approach to build out a digital cardiac rehab program to provide a hybrid approach to increase access to cardiac rehab. This is such an important problem that it re recently got uh, quite a bit of space in circulation with a, two, a Frontiers article as well as a science advisory on digital uh, cardiac rehab. And so we're currently conducting the MTech rehab uh, randomized trial of a hybrid approach to cardiac rehab for where patients come in for a couple, one or two visits and then shift towards mostly a home-based digitally enabled approach. The primary endpoint is a six-minute walk test because that is a focus of cardiac rehab, the exercise. Um, however, we also are looking at a bunch of secondary uh, endpoints, including LDL, blood pressure, and so forth, because we're really trying to holistically modify uh, cardiovascular risk. Cardiac rehab is not just a gym. It's a holistic program for secondary prevention. 
And I think as we think about novel strategies to scale up all that we know, this type of program is an example of how you can bring resources together to serve our patients. And should there be more of these types of organized prevention programs that are supported by technology and use a team-based approach? The main clinician in cardiac rehab is not cardiologists or physicians, it's exercise physiologists. Um, so here you see we're using a patient-centered app paired with wearables, blood pressure monitor. We have co a coach who sees the data on a clinical dashboard and is doing tailored coaching on a weekly basis. Um, we're more than halfway through enrolling in this trial and we'll be sharing results next year. Um, we're also pleased to be collaborating. That, that's really a single institution study. We've also been uh, pleased to come together with multiple other institutions in this McNair trial funded by PCORI, which is testing different pragmatic approaches to hybrid cardiac rehab. Um, so excited to share the results of those with you all in the future as well. So I'd just like to close by thanking uh, my team, thanking the AHA for putting together these great sessions, looking forward to the rich dialogue at uh, AHA sessions, and um, I will turn it over next to my colleague, Dr. Marvel. It's wonderful to see such enthusiasm around digital health and to also be presenting with such an esteemed group. Um, I guess as they're bringing the slides up, how many people here have a smartwatch on or a wearable that they use regularly? I'm not going to ask about smartphones because that could just be embarrassing for someone, but um, okay, good. So, <laughs> so again, um, excited to take you back to the thinking around obstacles and opportunities for digital health and how we started to really create some of the incredible work that we're doing now in digital health uh, as Dr. Martin just went through. My disclosures are here. Obstacles to cardiovascular prevention come in three groups, systems levels, practices, and behaviors. We know that acute care episodes are really running the show when it, when it turns to how are we going to be paying for things, procedure-based, episode-based care. We, we struggle with chronic manageable diseases. How do we activate patients to care about their health and to use these new tools? And how do we make sure that everyone has access? If we rely solely on in-person delivery, how are we ultimately going to reach the millions of patients in, across the United States, across the globe that need cardiovascular prevention? And once we discover these solutions that work, how do we create reimbursable systems? How do we create the policy for sustainable and scalable digital health? Now more than ever, digital health has emerged as a super social determinant of health. The digital inclusion that occurs when someone has access to smartphones, wearables, virtual visits, and AI and machine learning is no longer a question of the benefit. It's really how do we make sure that we can have more people have access to it, and as mentioned earlier, use it in ways where we help to steward and make sure we're only doing it for best practices and helping to support. I want to walk you through two patient stories. One is a secondary prevention cardiovascular case, and the second is a primary prevention cardiovascular case. Because to make this real, we need to put our, we need to be really in the shoes of the patient who's experienced this. Because ultimately, everything we do here, every reason that we're here today, is to deliver better care to our patients in our communities. I want to tell you about Tammy, who's 54. She has coronary artery disease and dyslipidemia. She's diabetic, tobacco use, poor diet and activity. She had her first heart attack when she was in her 40s, which is quite young. She was incarcerated. She had low levels of education, just finished elementary school, and didn't really have a good sense of what health was in general, and really fell through the cracks of our healthcare system. What was different when she walked through the doors of Johns Hopkins Hospital is we had started a clinical trial called MyCor trial that was not just taking a stack of papers and giving it to people when they left after having a heart attack to try to re-engineer their life on their own, but started it right after they came out of the cath lab or after having bypass surgery and engaged them with how do we actually do that? What are the daily care plan steps for taking my dual antiplatelet therapy or my statin? How do I get educated, not just on reading a bunch of papers, but watching engaging videos at my literacy level, which might be four or sixth grade level? 
connecting with clinicians knowing that they need to get to cardiac rehab, being able to share that information, and tracking important cardiac metrics. I think it's most powerful when we hear patients share how they experience the technology, not anticipate what they're going to say. And what, what Tammy wrote in this review that she co-authored with us is she didn't see what she was involved in as just an app. It was a program. And it activated her. It helped her to have a purpose and get off the couch when she otherwise would have just stayed there. And it obviously made an impact on her and her life. We amplified this across four different healthcare systems and many different types of patients. And what we found, and I want to shout out to Dr. Aaron Spaulding, who's also here, who was a leader on this trial, and of course, Dr. Martin P.I. What we found is that if we can activate and engage patients early in their secondary cardiovascular prevention and not use traditional methods, we made a difference in reducing 30-day all-cause readmission. We had an activated group of patients, and we saved healthcare dollars. Now, let's switch gears. This is a topic front of mind here, given that we just heard about semaglutide. For primary cardiovascular prevention, this is our opportunity to stop heart disease and cardiovascular disease before it, it really starts. This is a 41-year-old police officer. He's a diabetic, severe hypercholesterolemia, physically inactive, poor diet, and he lost his father at a tender age. 46, his father died at an MI. So all of us should be thinking about a strong family history and genetics. His labs did show he has very high cholesterol. His diabetes is uncontrolled and his LP little a is elevated. He's a busy cop. He didn't have time to show up for these appointments, had a lot of social struggles, struggles there. And the opportunity was to get him engaged in, in virtual first approach, where we bring patients in and do virtual care via telemedicine visits and start getting them engaged in, in standard practices. And what does virtual care bring to the table? For cardiovascular prevention, we can complete a lot of core tasks that are guideline associated, whether it's titrating statins or starting non-statin therapy like PCSK9, reviewing coronary artery calcification genetic testing, including family members that might not be able to make it because of their own scheduling, and addressing social determinants of health. You're older, you don't have transportation, you're unable to take off your time from your job because you're gonna lose it if you do. It's something that we should be using more and can really have a role in secondary prevention. When Jim went and had his coronary calcium score, not unsurprisingly, he already had subclinical atherosclerosis. We also were able to have him have a video visit with a genetic counselor, and he was positive for a variant that confirmed genetically that he had familial hypercholesterolemia. He also was started on Wagovi or semaglutide and had not only significant weight loss in the first four weeks of being on low dose, but also, of course, improvement in his hemoglobin A1C, which had been part of lifestyle modification. And interestingly, during the visit, he brought up that he had, a, he had a wearable. He was interested in how to use it besides just getting texts and alerts. And the opportunity arose, which all of us should consider, since many of us have smartwatches, are we really using it to its fullest? Are we helping coach patients how to use these tools? He now uses it to close his activity rings, to track his calorie burn, his weight management, as well as his um, general activity and steps. In addition to that, given his diabetes, he was interested in a continuous glucose monitor instead of finger pricks. And so he started to initiate his management with Freestyle Libre and did very well with that. Now, in talking about Tammy and Jim, we're, we're now asking to consider pulling in a lot of data that we need to curate in an intelligent way so that we can take this multiomics data, begin to start considering how machine learning can help us to better interpret and create actionable opportunities where we can predict disease. Imagine that instead of Jim having the outcome of his father who died at age 46 unexpectedly, we can expect that and we can prevent it. As we look to what's going to happen in the next decade, our prediction is that bringing together traditional cardiovascular risk factors, lipids, hypertension, smoking, family history, along with novel new factors like coronary artery calcium score, LPA, combining that with rich sensor and wearable data, app usage, the accelerometer, and then generating 
the data in a way that we can start to prioritize it using machine learning and algorithm. And ultimately, not have the data sit without action, but create closed loop actions that are recommended through the process of interpreting and making decisions about the data, which is all in collaboration with clinical human intelligence as well. And I just want to make a clear point that as exciting as all of this is, and <laughs> I'm right there with you, we have to find a way to be able to create sustainable and scalable technology. We need to advocate. We need to talk with not just physicians, clinicians. We need to get into our business sense. I know for those who are who are here from an entrepreneurial standpoint, this is music to your ears, but for those of you who are on the research side, the clinical side, you have ideas, we have to create these ideas in ways that support the purchase, the reimbursement, the consumer market, the ROI for those that will be investing in it. And I want to shout out to Pat Dunn, who's been relentless in trying to make sure that all the pieces that we need to have a complete solution that's sustainable and scalable, including business plan, and the right people in the room get there. And as we close on this topic, it's really important to think beyond medicine, beyond cardiology, beyond just what we're doing in our daily routine. And think about leaders in the field of technology like Apple, payers who would be the ones that are going to be driving the yes or no decisions around our technology and scalability. So what we did is we created a roadmap. How do you take tech-enabled CBD prevention delivery models and get it out to the masses? Build cross-sector uh, partnerships. Make, make sure you know what those payers must have. We even health equity, as Dr. Martin so eloquently emphasized. Make sure our AHA guidelines are front and center of what we're delivering. So we are delivering best practice care. And know how to scale. Don't have small visions of a 100 person pilot, 200. Let's get to 200 million people and then go from there. We worked closely with Aetna and Apple to create this roadmap. And I'm excited to share as the editor spotlight for, Jay, for the JAHA, a journal of the American Heart Association, we'll be publishing that in January 2024, so stay tuned. I want to thank the Chicaroni Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease for supporting the work that I've done and that we all continue to do. Shout out to my lab here. Um, uh, Dr. Izakaste is in the, uh, in the group. I see Dr. Spaulding. Hi. And, um, and thanks, for, thanks for everybody else that's joining us. Well, what a wonderful talk. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with you to participate in this symposium. Can people in the back hear me, by the way? Oh, okay, good, because I can hear that session, but I, I can't actually hear me. So it, it, maybe it's a little too much health tech and innovation going on, but, but, but hopefully people can actually uh, understand what I'm saying. Uh, so let me get started here. Uh, relevant disclosures to this talk include research funding from Clearly. I'll be discussing some of their technology in my talk. So there's a lot of exciting things going on in artificial intelligence, computational simulations, extended reality. All these things are converging uh, for a very exciting world in general, but including in medicine. And this stuff used to be hype, but now it's not hype anymore. It's actually entering not just the research realm, but the clinical practice of medicine. This is in the world of interventional cardiology, a drive-through, uh, the inside of a stent. Uh, using a variety of different uh, technologies, ex including extended reality. So th this is being used to plan bifurcation stenting, for example. So that's interventional cardiology, as well in electrophysiology and heart failure, applications of AI right now. This is using deep learning to predict cardiomyopathy from ECGs showing PVCs. Who would have thought? So uh, really exciting work in intervention and EP and heart failure. Uh, here's another example of some applications of artificial intelligence. This is the Hermes study. Uh, basically, this involved uh, surveying men and women getting cardiac catheterizations, seeing what symptoms they report, transcribing those reports, seeing how the doctor interpreted the symptoms, seeing how a machine learning algorithm interpreted the symptoms. Uh, and what we found was surprise. Men and women actually, for the most part, if they have obstructive CAD and they're presenting to a cath lab, 
have chest discomfort. That is the most predominant symptom. That's the case in men. It's also the case in women. So despite all the noise out there about how men and women present differently, that might be true in terms of how the physician or nurse or physician's assistant hears the symptoms or elicits the symptoms, but at least uh, a machine learning algorithm doing it objectively elicited and heard the same symptoms for men and women. So potential uses of artificial intelligence to actually combat bias, to decrease bias in medicine. Of course, some have written about the potential for AI based on where it's getting its data to, to, to exacerbate or, or continue biases. But the opposite possibility also exists where we can reduce biases, uh, perhaps looking at the objectivity of machines versus the biases of humans. Well, anyway, how can all this uh, AI potentially be used for prevention? I showed some applications in intervention EP, heart failure, but, but what about in prevention? Uh, there's secondary prevention, there's primary prevention, there's primordial prevention. Can we deploy AI and machine learning in ways to actually help? Well, I think we need to do something beyond what we're doing now. These are some recent data published in JAMA from NHANES looking at U.S. adults with coronary artery disease, showing that if we talk about the ACCAHA guidelines for cholesterol in green, one in four U.S. adults with CAD is achieving that. And if we go with the more aggressive, I think even uh, perhaps more um, uh, evidence-based guidelines for lipid lowering of uh, less than 55, only one in 10 is in green there. So look at all the red. So that's what we're doing in prevention now, a pretty bad job, uh, collectively speaking. Maybe there are ways we can encourage ourselves, our patients to do better than that. That was the secondary prevention universe that I just showed in poor cholesterol control. But you can imagine primary prevention, it's an even worse situation. And maybe using genetics and biomarkers and different sorts of risk stratification algorithms will help. There are good studies going on. But perhaps imaging could help even more, actually seeing plaque. And in fact, there's data to support that. This is some data from Dr. Sandu and Rodriguez and Dr. Marin, who's here in the audience from Stanford, the Notify One study, uh, looking at patients and notifying them about coronary artery calcification or just usual care. And look at the impact on statin prescription at six months. It's dramatic, the effect of the patient seeing they've got calcium in their coronary arteries. So if that surrogate of coronary artery disease, coronary artery calcium, uh, could cause such dramatic effects. What might actually looking at coronary plaque do? And this is using the uh, clearly uh, AI-enabled whole heart coronary artery disease evaluation. Hopefully the video is projecting well enough for you to see there in the back. And this is taking a look at the coronary artery itself, looking at plaque its volume, its distribution, its composition, its potential to contribute to ischemia, and using some pr pretty sophisticated algorithms then, trying to decide what stage of coronary artery disease does a patient have. Much like we stage in cancer, staging of coronary artery disease. And potentially not only looking at things in a static way in time, but even repeating the assessment in time, as was done here, looking at how the plaque changes in terms of its volume and its constituents, its composition, and potentially then using that information to see, do we need to do more in terms of lifestyle modification, in terms of intensive medical therapy? Intuitively, it makes sense to do it right now. But I'm happy to announce here from the podium for the first time the TRANSFORM trial. Uh, and this is a trial designed to transform cardiovascular medicine. I hope everything I said till now sounds intuitive, but intuition's nice, evidence is even better, and that's the goal of the TRANSFORM trial, to enroll approximately 7,500 patients, men greater than or equal to 55, women greater than or equal to 65, with diabetes, pre-diabetes, or metabolic syndrome, but with no symptomatic cardiovascular disease. So primary prevention type patients, uh, and then uh, obtaining uh, consent on these folks, of course, uh, getting that clearly coronary CT angio with all the bells and whistles, and randomizing these patients to either usual guideline-based care or to a personalized strategy where they get the CT, uh, the patient gets to see it, the doctor gets to see it, everybody gets to see it, there's a report, and then based on what stage of coronary artery disease they have, 
uh, intensive medical therapy, an algorithm of titrating multi-poly pharmacy in an, we think, evidence-based sort of way. Uh, the CT is repeated at year two, uh, and again, in the intensive arm, that information is used to potentially further titrate therapy if there has been disease progression, for example. In the usual care arm, there is a CT at baseline in two years, uh, but everybody's blinded to that until the end of the study where we'll unblind. Uh, and this part of the trial is designed to evaluate MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events. And as I mentioned, the idea is to really target residual cardiovascular risk beyond what the guidelines are already telling us to do. That's what the usual care arm is going to get. But in the arm where we're guided by the knowledge of whether the patient has plaque and how high risk that plaque is, we will go after all the different risk factors shown on this slide and more, targeting cholesterol-associated risk, inflammatory-associated risk, thrombotic-associated risk, and so forth. So that's really the goal of the study. And we've uh, assembled, I think, a really terrific team. Uh, academic uh, folks, I'm really fortunate to co-chair this trial with Dr. David Marin from Stanford, who's sitting here in the audience, and, and a number of other really uh, outstanding academicians. Uh, our DMC is chaired by Dr. Bob Harrington, who you just heard speak, as well as uh, uh, other fantastic folks. CPC and the University of Colorado are the academic research uh, coordinating center for the trial. So. Uh, great academicians, but a partnership not only with Clearly, who are sponsoring the trial, but other industry partners, such as Lexicon, who will be providing Sotigaflozin, an SGLT1-2 inhibitor recently approved. Now, Esperion, who will be providing bempedoic acid uh, in combination bempedoic acid and azetamibe, again, uh, recently uh, tested in trial, recently approved for that indication. Uh, Heartbeat Health. Uh, who's going to provide cardiologic care in a structured way uh, to make sure that we really are intensifying the medical therapy in an evidence-based way, uh, and Agefa Pharma, uh, who will be providing colchicine, which, again, recently uh, has had uh, FDA approval. So uh, a bunch of different companies that are partnering with us, hopefully more, hopefully there are folks in the audience that are interested in contributing this trial uh, and really trying to transform cardiovascular men uh, medicine and how we uh, perform prevention, how we view prevention. And transforms, really, three trials in one. I talked to you just now about transform outcomes, looking at hard cardiovascular outcomes. But built into this is also transform plaque, where we'll be looking at plaque progression, the effects of therapy on plaque progression. Plaque progression is a predictor event. So, so a bunch of different things that we'll be doing there. And transform classify to see if this approach of using imaging, of using this risk stratification of, uh, of um, uh, patients based on their imaging and the AI-enabled information that we get from that imaging can classify patients in a way better than the risk scores that we're using today. So really three trials built into one. And ultimately the goal is to move primary prevention in a way that we keep patients from getting to the apex of this pyramid where they have heart failure or myocardial infarctions or stroke or out of hospital sudden cardiac death. I mean, that's the real problem with primary prevention right now. We're not identifying the patients that are highest risk. Even when we do, we're not getting them treated appropriately. But perhaps this approach, based on imaging and using AI to enhance risk stratification and guide medical therapy, can really put a dent in the cardiovascular epidemic. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Um Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's always hard to bring up the rear, especially after Deepak Bot, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, I, my name is James Min. I am a uh, cardiologist. I spent about 15 years at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital and Cornell, Wild well, Cornell Medicine. Unfortunately, I left at the end of 2020 to pursue a company called Clearly. Um, so I didn't have the chance to work with Bob Harrington, but I would have stuck around had I known that he was showing up as dean. Um, I'll try to spend the next 10 minutes or so trying to talk about maybe four different things, sort of the problem that I see it, um, some scientific observations that we learned over the last 15 years or so, um, how we could clinically implement it, and then hopefully how we can uh, clinically scale it. Um, so my, the topic that was assigned to me was um, entitled From Population-Based to Personalized Medicine and Could Imaging Help Positively Influence That? I modified it to stratified medicine um, rather than population-based just to be more true to the nomenclature. 
Um, but what I'll start with is I think that cardiology over any other subspecialty in medicine has led the field in evidence-based medicine uh, with a focus on stratified medicine, right? So rather than on the left, the traditional approach of trial and error with each individual patient, we've used, utilized and leveraged the randomized control trial mechanism really in order to prove that our therapies work and to prove that groups of, of, of folks who are sicker versus not sicker uh, could benefit from certain therapies. What we haven't done is gone into that third step, I think, in, in a meaningful way, and that's what the topic of today will be. Um, but in, in the stratified medicine approach, I think that we've done extremely well. Um, you've heard a lot uh, from Dr. Martin earlier today about all of these blockbuster advances that we've seen in primary prevention and secondary prevention medical therapy. Now, like 10 years ago, we had statins in our toolbox. We have at least a dozen different families of medications that we can use for primary prevention. And that was all proven by the course of the randomized control trial mechanism, focusing on that stratified medicine. If you do sort of a nerdy exercise of assuming all of those relative risk reductions within those trials are actually additive in the right people, you hit an additive relative risk reduction of about 95%. So if you ask what the problem is, um, why coronary heart disease remains the number one cause of death across the world, and you say, is it a treatment problem or is it an identification problem? I think that we've got enough tools in our toolbox right now to eradicate heart attacks from the face of the earth. We just do a very poor job identifying the patients um, before their event. And so I'll give you an example of this, of why stratified medicine does not actually effectively pinpoint individuals who are at risk of coronary heart disease events. And what you're seeing here is a cartoon depiction of a randomized trial, right? We take some sicker group and we take some healthier group and we say, well, the sicker group will have more events. And then we start to randomize those folks into, for example, statin therapy. So in the statin therapy example on the left, what you'll see is a 20% relative risk reduction of all of those yellow people and 20% of them will turn green. Um, but what that implies is that there's an 80% residual risk amongst that sicker group. And because the LDL is lower and the statins have been prescribed, we actually can't effectively pinpoint the individual within that group who is not responding to statin therapy. On the other hand, while we look at these groups of, say, higher LDL versus lower LDL, if you take a look at the healthier group, depending on how you cut the LDL threshold, about 70% of these patients who are, oops, who are considered healthy um, by their LDL are the ones who present with first myocardial infarction and normal cholesterol levels. So it's not a great biomarker for pinpointing individuals who are at risk of, of heart attacks. So what do we do? We just combine everything that we know into a combinatorial integration of risk factors and a single risk score. Everybody knows the ACVD risk estimator. We know that it's okay, um, but it's not great, right? And all of the studies that looked at the area under the curve to discriminate future adverse cardiovascular events, the highest you reach is around 0.7 area under the curve. So it's not very effective. It's definitely not comprehensible. Telling a patient they have a 7.9% 10-year risk of events doesn't mean anything to that patient. We know it's biased. It tends to work best in middle-aged white men. And it's definitely incomplete. With all of the new biomarkers that we have, um, there's a laundry list of things that are not included in the ASCVD risk estimator. So how does this work out in the real world? Um, so in preparation for this transform trial, we looked at about 300 million lives uh, across the country. Uh, these were EMR data and claims data. Uh, we identified about 4.6 million patients who had suffered acute myocardial infarction, and then just tried to ask some extremely simple questions. The first on the left is, how many of them were symptomatic before they had their event, who had chest pain, shortness of breath, any kinds of symptoms? It turns out the majority of the patients had no symptoms before their event, and they're in blue. And if you look then on the right and you say, well, okay, amongst those asymptomatic people who will suffer heart attacks, uh, about 28% did not have a single traditional coronary heart disease risk factor. About 42% never saw a doctor, and almost 75% of them were not on a single preventive medical therapy. And while these, see, these results seem fairly tragic, they're likely overly optimistic because the claims data doesn't actually account for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and sudden coronary death. So these are likely underestimated numbers as opposed to overestimated. So if you then take a step back from this abstract and you say, well, you know, how can we possibly impact the number one cause of death if the patients who suffer or die from acute myocardial infarction 
do so without any risk factors, without any symptoms, they don't see doctors, and they don't subsequently get any preventive medical therapy. I think the only way we can do this is actually to go upstream to where the patients are, rather than to do it the way that we've been doing, which is relying on them coming to us in the cardiology clinics, will never make a dent into the major uh, groups that will suffer acute myocardial infarction. And so in 2017, I was just sitting on my couch at home and a commercial came up on Keytruda. And then they ended this commercial and I said, well, you know, and this commercial was actually what started sort of thinking about Transform in a certain way. Because at the end of the commercial, they said on the bottom, hey, you know what, if you test positive for PDL1 and you're EGFR negative and ALK gene negative, you may qualify for Keytruda. And I just thought to myself, like, when did this happen? Like, when I was training as a medicine resident, we didn't have any of this kind of personalized therapies or personalized diagnostics to really guide our therapeutic decision making. And it really got me to start thinking about whether or not we could improve our understanding of coronary heart disease events and risk if we started to personalize it. The problem is that we don't have a single smoking gun, not one somatic gene mutation. Instead, we've got this extremely polyfactorial disease where all roads lead back to Rome, right? That manifestation of atherosclerosis. But we've got all these different clinical risk states, autoimmunity, age, gender, um, race, etc. And then if you start to go lower into the cellular pathways, there's not a single smoking gun there to intervene on as well. And what I realized is that coronary disease is not a disease, it's a syndrome, right? It's mediated by lifestyle, by situations, by inflammation, by thrombosis, by cardiometabolic disorders, by renal disorders, and, and so on. And it's all of that that leads to a common end uh, disease state of phenotypic manifestation of atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis instability. So if that's the case, then how can we actually try to utilize that to our advantage? Well, in 2013, we started a cardiovascular disease prevention program called Heart Health at Cornell and New York Presbyterian. And what we did was we adopted a lot of the research findings that we had discovered in the trials that we had run. And then we also, honestly, we just copied the most successful preventive care paradigms in, in medicine. So when I look back 20 years ago and I was taught as a medicine resident, we were recommending all the things on the left side. And over the last 20 uh, two years, uh, or 20 years, um, they've all been supplanted by some form of advanced imaging that allows for direct visualization of disease, whether it's mammograms, colonoscopies, lung CTs, cap smears, and so on. All of those share the commonality of that they directly visualize disease. When I think about that in contrast with the way I was trained as a cardiology fellow 20 years ago, we don't do that, right? We do it exactly the same way, where we look at risk factors of heart disease, which are upstream of the disease process itself, we wait for people to get ischemia and chest pain, uh, which is downstream of the actual disease process. We throw them on treadmills and look for this ischemia and ST segment depression and so on. And you can see from the numbers that it fails to identify the majority of people who will suffer acute myocardial infarctions. So we did, in about 2004, we adopted this technology, a coronary CT angiogram that would allow for contrast-enhanced uh, assessment of the vascular wall and the phenotypic manifestation of atherosclerosis. It's gotten a lot better over the years, and it is the only non-invasive test for symptomatic patients that we've ever seen in coronary heart disease within the context of a randomized control trial that actually improves event-free survival, which is why it was elevated to a level 1A recommendation for both acute chest pain and stable chest pain in the 2021 chest pain guidelines. Where its advantage, I think, is in the description on the right, where you see the invasive angiogram, you see the CT angiogram. LAD is bookmarked by those two yellow um, bars. It's the same patient who doesn't have symptoms, who doesn't have a stenosis, who doesn't have ischemia, but if you look carefully, has a tremendous amount of atherosclerosis that is building up silently within the walls of the artery. The problem is, I think that when we started understanding that we didn't understand the, the atherosclerosis at all. When we started the trials, we thought that all plaque was bad, but it turns out we were totally wrong. Um, heart disease is not a single disease. It's not, a, and, and not at a single point in time. It changes over time. So what you see is an LAD that we've straightened out. We cut up like a loaf of bread into different slices, and everything that's colored is plaque. And so the colors of plaque are red, yellow, and blue. 
And what you can see is the red represents this very dark plaque, um, the yellow represents more gray plaque, and the blue represents essentially the bright calcified plaques. Every trial that we've seen published in the last 15 years has shown that the darker the plaque, the more dangerous it is. And once you hit that red threshold, that is the strongest discriminant of which, of which lesion and which patient will suffer heart attacks. And on the opposite side of that continuum, the brighter the plaque, the more stable it is. There was a paper that we published in JAMA Cardiology a few years back that showed that once you get above 1,000 Hounsfield units of brightness, those plaques are associated with a lower rate of acute myocardial infarction. And so if the dark plaques are bad and the bright plaques are good, it sort of conjures up this question of how do you turn dark plaques bright? And so we had done a serial CT study treating some patients with statins and others without. And what we found was that statins, PCSK9 inhibitors, colchicine, um, DASH diet, physical activity, all these good things that we do for patients, they don't make plaque go away per se. They transform the morphology of the plaque from dark to bright. And that was the key to preventing heart attacks in an eight-year follow-up. So if you think, okay, well, this is sort of a boring slide because it's got a bunch of imaging on it. Like, what, what do we have here? What we have is a personalized approach to heart attack prevention where we can do personalized diagnostics. We can do precision prognosis. Um, we can really try to guide our therapeutic de decision-making on an N of 1 basis rather than guessing from sort of associative markers like uh, cholesterol. And so I told you that we had started this cardiovascular disease prevention program called Heart Health. That's exactly what we did in 2013. That is my friend and colleague, Erica Jones, um, who was at Cornell with me. And what we did was we did a baseline CT angiogram, and every few years, uh, we'd repeat it to make sure that we were achieving our therapeutic goals of stopping disease and stabilizing and turning the dark plaques bright. Over the course of seven years with four and a half cardiologists, we didn't see a single myocardial infarction. So we thought we might be onto something, but it was taking us like eight, 10 hours to analyze a single patient's image. We had the luxury of being on the Upper East Side and being supported by generous philanthropy, but we knew that it would never scale past the Cornell walls. And that was formed the advent of Clearly. So when we started Clearly, we never intended to be an imaging company. We've never intended to be an AI company. We use imaging and it's AI through and through. But what we wanted to do instead was to just standardize and personalize a care pathway for evaluation, education, treatment, and tracking of coronary heart disease. It looks something like this. Um, six years ago when we, when we envisioned it, it looked like this, that there were five steps. We would try to evaluate an individual's coronary heart disease using imaging. We would try to educate the clinicians taking care of the patients from all the way from the primary care all the way to interventional cardiology. We try to empower patients with health literacy so they understood what we were treating, why we were treating, how we were gonna treat it, and how we were gonna track it. We had to figure out how to treat atherosclerosis, which was a hard thing, because how do you treat heart disease when we've never actually done that? We've treated upstream markers of heart disease and downstream sequelae of heart disease like stenosis or ischemia, but we've never treated the disease itself. And then finally, how do you track therapeutic success? Or in the case of therapeutic failure, we've got so many tools in our armamentarium that we can now try to modify therapies to achieve success. So this is the first step. Um, it's the evaluation step. So what you see here is the software as a service platform. It's an all-in-one coronary disease solution. It gives you whole heart evaluation of atherosclerosis, stenosis, and ischemia by vessel. Um, we trained it on about 10 million uh, image, annotated images. There's end-to-end -end AI coming through it, and it's been validated against every non-invasive test as well as every invasive coronary catheter that we could think of, including QCA, OCT, IVUS, FFR, and NEARS. And then the 10-hour analytic time came down to about seven minutes or so. And then the problem, so we solved for the efficiency and for the precision and accuracy problem. We haven't solved for the literacy problem. Unless you're an imager, nobody cares about this, this um, picture there, and nobody's gonna go through all of those numbers. So what we did was we developed a translational platform for clinicians. So it starts with this centerpiece page. This is exactly the same patient as the slide before. It's just the data is visualized in a way that's actionable and easy to understand. 
It's also fully interactive. And so we used to use the images to educate the patients. Once they saw their actual disease, their compliance rates went through the roof. And so now you can interact. You don't have to go down to radiology. You just go on the web and start looking at these images with the patient, teaching them what they have. And you can see from all the tabs that are on top, it's multi-level. So it hits every stakeholder along the care continuum, including primary care, general cardiology, preventive cardiology, interventional cardiology, radiology, researchers, and so on. Once the clinicians are on the same page, now we've got to get the patients to come with us. And what they said to us was like, look, we don't understand the things that we, we understand it when we're in the office. We just don't understand it when we go home. And so we generate a 25 page personalized report for every patient's analysis. It's written at a fifth grade reading level so that any non-medical layperson can truly understand it. And so now they know as they're going home, the condition we're actually trying to intervene upon. Now that the patients understand it, now we've got to treat it, and we didn't know how to treat it, right? And as Dr. Bott mentioned, like, we, we, we've never staged coronary heart disease. We stage every single other disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, asthma, and we, we'd never staged this disease because we never measured it at scale. So we created a staging algorithm, and in collaboration with the ACC Innovations in Prevention Working Group, created a very logical, thoughtful treatment algorithm based upon those stages that wasn't based solely on the risk factors of heart disease, but the actual amount of disease that individual has, the type of disease, and most importantly, how they progress over time. And that leads us to the last step of this pathway, which this is actually a cardiologist who taught me how to cath, and in 2020 came in with 260 units of plaque was put on a PCSK9 inhibitor, got another scan in 2023, still at 260 units of plaque. He solved the first problem. We've stopped new disease formation in his arteries. And then if you look at the type of plaque, all the dark non-calcified plaques dropped by about 80, and all the bright calcified plaques went up by about 80. He's transforming the morphology of his pre-existing plaque uh, from more unstable uh, to stable. And so if you... If you think that that's gonna take a long time, it really doesn't. It's software as a service, so it's about an hour turnaround time to get all of that, um, and it's automatically done. And then I will say that, um, you know, when we started with stratified medicine, we started within leveraging the randomized control trial mechanism. I think once you get to this personalized medicine, still the most rigorous way you can prove this is through the concept of a randomized control trial. You heard Dr. Bott talk about the transform trial. Just in a single bullet nutshell, it's trying to answer a screening question, right? In an asymptomatic at-risk screening population, is the evaluation and the treatment of an individual's actual heart disease superior to to the evaluation and treatment of an individual's risk factors of heart disease. So we'll start that soon. We're very thankful to the American Heart Association for the opportunity to present. We're part of their innovators network. If there are companies out here who are not part of that innovators network, please join. It's a valuable and a fruitful collaboration that we've had uh, with the American Heart Association. So on that note, I'll end. Thank you very much.